Welcome everyone to the Diatom Web Academy brought to you by the Diatom Taxonomic Certifi Certification Committee of the Society for Freshwater Science and diatoms.org. Uh, check out the news page on diatoms.org for the list of webinar speakers. You can also watch our recordings on the YouTube channel. And if you're interested in participating as a speaker or would like to suggest a topic you want to learn about, please contact any of the Web Academy organizers. Our next webinar is on February 16 on microalgae-based biofuels. And I just wanted to note that the speaker is based in Hawaii. So the webinar will start an hour and a half later than our usual time. So make a note of this change on your calendars so you don't miss us. Today we have Mark Edlund who will introduce our speaker and Sarah Spaulding who will lead the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Over to you, Mark. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Sylvia. Well, it's a real treat today to introduce um, Melissa Vaccarino. Melissa comes from environmental, Enviro Science in Ohio where she's an aquatic biologist and has been there in that position for seven years now. Um, Melissa is also a member of our TCC, our Diatom Taxonomic Certification Committee and adding her expertise uh, in helping us develop certification procedures for diatom analysts. Uh, Melissa did her graduate work at John Carroll University with Jeff Johansson where she worked on cyanobacteria, not on diatoms. We talked a little bit yesterday about how she slipped into diatoms um, and you know, got away from the dark side of those, uh, of those cyanobacteria. Even though she described a bunch of species and genera of, of cyanobacteria, she's now dedicated to diatoms. So thanks, thanks Melissa, and uh, give, us, give us some diatoms 101, please. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, welcome everybody. This is just a basic overview of diatoms. So if you're not familiar with these guys, um, we can get started. So diatoms are a group of algae and algae is a very vague term that describes aquatic photosynthetic organisms and it includes um, a, multi uh, a variety of different organisms, including eukaryotic, which are those organisms that have a cell with a membrane bound nucleus and prokaryotic uh, such as bacterial organisms. So um, the difference between algae and plants is that algae lack vascular tissue. So for example, uh, you, this picture of, of some sea kelp, even though they can be um, very large, they're still not technically plants. And versus over here, you have some duckweed, which are very small, they have vascular tissues. Um, and then up here is some cyanobacteria. And again, these are uh, bacteria. So very different, very different groups of organisms um, can be described by the word algae. So diatoms themselves are microscopic eukaryotes and they are in the class Bacillariophyce. You can see them when you're out in the field when they're in large numbers. So if you've ever slipped a bit on a rock in a stream, you might have slipped on some diatoms. Visible here. And um, you can also see them uh, in an aerial view over Lake Erie. Here's some Alocasera in the winter. And uh, they may even explode. Uh, uh, in an unusual case in New Zealand, where this diatom, Gonfospenia, um, is taking advantage of some environmental condition and growing to uh, very large levels. So you can find diatoms pretty much anywhere that there is water and light. And uh, lots, of, lots of research has been done on these and lots of species still have not been described. And the estimates are that there are somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000 different species. Diatoms are also defined by their habitat. So paraphyton are typically attached to rocks or plants, again in this picture. And then there's also phytoplankton, which are free floating in the water columns. So then that would be the, these guys here. 
So again, diatoms are composed of single cellular units. They're called a frustal. And what's special about them is that they have this um, silicious shell um, that is their outer cell wall. And I don't know if you are able to view my screen, but I have a small um, model. Uh, so the cells are, are made of two parts that fall apart like this. Um, so it's you've got the whole thing is a frustule, and then you've got two valves that come together, kind of like a um, a petri dish would would kind of be better um, to think of. And then they are attached in the middle with a girdle band. Um, in this example, you can see some free uh, swimming diatoms, and this one is in valve view, so you can see like the top view. And this one is in girdle view, where you would be seeing the side view. And this side view is more difficult to tell what species it is. Um, you get this rectangular shape. Um, so again, diatoms can be attached. Um, here's Sarah's photo of uh, Didymosphenia again, showing um, these mucilaginous stalks. So they can attach to rocks or other plants. And diatoms can also be uh, colony forming. And so here you see a long strand of uh, Melosyra where uh, each of these are frustules. So why do we look at diatoms? Um, as bioindicators, they're very uh, beneficial because there's a large number of species that have specific water chemistry requirements. Um, and there's a lot of research going on uh, catalog, cataloging new species. And so as we learn more, um, we can add to uh, how, many, how many diatoms are, are useful as indicators um, as we find, as we discover their specific requirements. Uh, sample collection has little to no impact on the environment. So you can just take a tiny scraping and get millions of cells in a little bag you can, you can take to the lab. Um, the cost of monitoring is favorable compared to chemistry or other taxa. And algae with uh, their, uh, or diatoms with their turnover can respond quickly to chemical or physical insults. So you don't have to wait uh, for something like biomagnification to see um, if something could potentially be um, wrong with, uh, or uh, leaching into your environment. And the diatoms are also persistent in nature. So because of their silicious cell uh, wall, they are uh, fossilized in, in the earth. So you can take a core in a lake, for, and that's paleo, paleo limnology. You, you can see the history of a lake by looking at the diatoms that have settled over time. Um, Nakwa and Nursa are two of the um, major assessments that we have in the US. And these sample across the United States at looking at um, the relative cleanliness of the water. Um, and one good book that you can take a look at for very specific diatoms as indicators would be uh, this book by Stormer and Small, The Diatoms. It has a very good uh, collection of focus studies that track climatic change over time in different biomes and describes other applications uh, of diatoms from forensics to industrial. So human uses, I feel like sometimes this is a little bit um, neglected when we talk about diatoms. Um, they're a candidate for biofuel production. And again, you can join us February 16th for more on that. Um, you can find diatomaceous earth in abrasives such as toothpaste. So you may not have realized if you use um, a typical toothpaste, you can find um, diatoms in there under the uh, ingredient list hydra hydrated silica. Um, filtration, diatomaceous earth is also used for filtration. Um, and then artistic inspiration. So this slide is a is a Victorian era slide um, from the and researchers or artists did these as a uh, 
art form from the 1830s to about 1900, where they arranged diatoms on a slide. Uh, and a modern artist is Klaus Kemp, and uh, you can check out his uh, his work in a in a short video. Uh, Mark has posted the link. So after after this uh, presentation, if you want to check out some more of these really cool slides, um, you can see some there. A more artwork, you can join us to see Javier Cortada on March 30th. And so how do we identify diatoms? They have a complex morphology in which their shape and valve face view are critical for morphological species identification. So in other words, they have to be, I mean, not all, some are identifiable in girdle view, but most of the information most of the time is gonna be on that, on that front face. And so we clean diatoms out from the organics so you don't see any chloroplasts in here um, in order to uh, view the details. So in the laboratory, we just um, boil the samples in nitric acid, and then they are rinsed and concentrated. And then this is also somewhat an art form sometimes is to drip a appropriate amount of material onto the slide so that they are easily viewable. And then they are dried and mounted to a slide uh, using nafrax. And so once we look at it under the slide, um, I like to go to diatoms.org. So from their website, uh, Diatoms North America is a collaborative effort to document the diversity of diatom species in North America. We aim to provide accurate information on diatom identification, ecology, and distribution. And I want to mention that this is such a valuable resource for both getting taxonomists on the same page in regards to naming conventions and also for keeping up with current taxonomy. Diatoms include hundreds of species across a scattered literature and research advancement calls for a living resource that is highly accessible as well as peer reviewed. So a big thanks to these agencies, EPA, USGS and INSAR and all the taxonomists who make this webpage available. So some morphological features we should know before we try to identify what diatom we have. Um, the areoli are these small openings in the silica cell wall, and they allow for interaction with the environment um, so they can interact with the water uh, and any uh, ions or nutrients that might be in the water. Striae are rows of areoli. So in this example here, you can see, uh, in this case, you can see the areoli and uh, they are arranged in rows of striae. The raphe is this line here, which allows for cell motility. Not all diatoms will have a raphe and some will have more than one. A canal is the channel in the cell wall. So in this case, the raphe is inside the channel and it allows for specialized motility. And a keel, is an instance of elevated siliceous thickening that allows the raphe maximum contact with surfaces or motility, motility. So here you can see this kind of narrow uh, lip is, the, is where you would find um, the raphe in, in this diatom. So when I try to identify diatom, one of the first things I look at is the overall shape. Is it centric, symmetrical, or asymmetrical? Um, centrics are the ones with radial symmetry. So you can slice these like you could slice a pizza pie, say, and you would get um, two even spots. Um, you have symmetry around a central point. In bilateral symmetry, you get a mirage, uh, a mirror image both to the apical and transapical axis. And so apical axis is, um, so oops, the apices are at the ends here. And so 
This is symmetrical. to both the apical and transapical axis. Here's a gonfonemoid that is, or again, it's didymosphenia, that is asymmetric to the transapical axis. Uh, again, so it slices um, the apices and you get on either side a mirror image, but you would not be able to slice it um, to the apical axis here because this end is larger than the other apex. This one is asymmetrical to the apical axis, again, dividing in the other direction. Sigmoid is a little special because um, you would get a mirror image that is inverted. So if you can imagine um, like if you fold, if you have a sigmoid, you fold it in half and then you have to fold it again um, to get that shape. Um, these are a bit special. If you've got a sigmoid with uh, two, two raphes, you want to consider them in, in the bilateral uh, symmetry. Diatoms can also be asymmetric. There is no way to split this actinella and get even, even pieces. And then the next thing that I'd look for is the presence or absence of the raphe in the center of the valve. Um, so they may have no raphe, which is araphid, one, which is monoraphid, or two, which is biraphid. And so these will be on matching uh, valves. So when you look through the microscope, you would be able to see uh, if you've got a complete valve that didn't fall apart, both valves don't have it, a raphe. In monoraphid, you can see one valve has a raphe and the other does not. And in symmetrical biraphids, again, you would focus through. And in this case, you would see the exact same thing again, uh, where you have a raphe on both valves. And so from here, you, you've, you can omit or you can, you can definitively say in the previous slide, OK, I had a centric. Here, you can, if you see this, you can say, okay, I have a monoraphid. As long as you have both valves, you can say, okay, I have a monoraphid. I have a symmetrical biraphid or I have an asymmetrical biraphid. I'm gonna hold off on deciding if it's araphid until I tell you about um, the other special types. So the next thing that I wanna look for when I look at a diatom is the positioning of the rafe uh, when it is present. And so I will, I will go over these. Eunoshoids are asymmetrical to the apical axis, usually with the raphe on the valve mental and face. And so, you know, if you're not familiar with these special raphe, you might not notice it, but it is here in valve view. You can barely see, uh, not always, but in this one, you can, you can see it, uh, the raphe comes up from the mantle a little bit onto the valve face. Here's the diatom in girdle view. Hard to identify the species, but at least you can tell it's eunoshid because you can see the shortened raphe system. In the epithemioid, these are also asymmetrical to the apical axis, and the rafe is in a canal that may or may not be obvious in the light microscope. So in this one, here's the canal and the rafe is located through here. And on this one, it's a little less obvious, but, but the raphe is located through here. For epithemioids, when I see them, I tend to think they're kind of boat-shaped. The nitioids, they're usually symmetrical to both axes, and the raphe is supported by fibulae. So the raphe is on the side, and these uh, silica bars are, are the fibulae. And so you would see um, fibulae on both valves only coming on one side of each valve, usually. In the sororeloids, they have bilateral symmetry and their raphe is supported by fibulae all away around the valve margin. So you can see these short fibulae again 
the rafies around the entire valve margin. And so um, here is a summary of what uh, we've just reviewed. If you're going to participate, you might want to take a snapshot with your cell phone of these definitions because we're going to look at some diatoms uh, after we review some of the more common genera in each of these morphological groups. So the centrics, again, they laugh a raphe system and they have radial symmetry. Chain forming diatoms, uh, chain forming centrics may appear rectangular, but remember if you're looking at them like this, you wanna in your mind's eye imagine they're like this. And so once you know you have a centric, you're gonna to wanna to look at the central area and what is doing in the middle of each of these valve faces. You may see areolae uh, that are aligned as striae or not aligned and are just kind of um, random or in sectional patterns around this valve face. And you can look for special structures such as spines, CD, or processes. So for example, in Catoceros, you can see the CD, um, which helps with the buoyancy um, on this species, or in Actinocyclus, you can see what's called the Remoportula. You might not always be able to see some of these special processes, um, uh, but here you can see the Remoportula. These are a lip-shaped, uh, tubular processes in the silica cell wall. And so these are some of the more common genera that you're going to find uh, in the centrics. Melosyra is a, is a nice, easy one. There's very little ornamentation um, on these cell, cells and their colony forming. So they look like this. Um, on Alocasira, some similar, but you can see that they have um, striae and the colonies, some col the colonies joined by spines, you may see some spines jutting out um, when they're uh, in the girdle view like this. And then cyclotella, uh, this one has the valve face with a differential ornamentation between a central and marginal area. And they be, may be, uh, the central area may be flat or undulate. And you may wanna be a little careful here um, because you can see that the girdle view in some Malacoceras may, um, uh, to an untrained eye, appear as though they might be cyclotella. So you want to look around the slide uh, if it's uh, quite abundant and see if you can make this distinction. Um, Mark, if you have the uh, link from here to get to species on these, you'd want to count. Um, the number of striae, uh, the amount, of, the density of the striae for these. And so that would, that's a good reference to use. A raphids lack the raphi system and they have bilateral symmetry usually to the transapical axis. You'll again want to look closely at the central area and see how these differ. And many of these um, will make long colonies um, when they're alive and make intricate, um, beautiful looking colonies. And you'll see some in clean slides, some remnants, sometimes the colonies will stick together. Fragilaria is one of the most commonly reported genera and uh, species are uh, a bit difficult sometimes for these. Um, they have lanceolate valves and again, may form long colonies. You're gonna wanna look at the overall shape and uh, the stri density. You're gonna wanna look for if there's an expanded central margin. In ulnaria, these tend to be quite elongate compared to fragile area. And the central area is gonna have uh, a larger space on, and may contain ghost striae. So you can kind of see maybe some striae were forming here. And you can find rimaportula, again, that lip-shaped process on both sides 
on both AFCs in ulnaria. In diatoma, uh, you have transapical costae. These are um, siliceous thickenings that give some support to the cell structure. And these also have a rimaportula that are sometimes visible here. And that will help you determine the species, the present, uh, where that one is located. And when you do see these ones live, they form zigzag colonies. Monoraphids, bilateral symmetry, raphe versus raphless valve. So you can see here the paired valve uh, faces, and one will have a raphe and one will not. And again, you'll want to see if you can find some interesting structures. So here, um, on Gilwitzia and Planethidium, you may see a cavum. Um, you may see a deflection of the rafe, such as in this Eucacaneus, or you may see um, a wide central uh, area here where there's no striae in on one face of Lemnicola. So Acanthidium, one of the most reported. Uh, monoraphids, and often uh, this species, Minutissimum, is been, has been a lump species, uh, and so uh, care has to be taken to differentiate what species of Acnanthidium you have. You'll have to look very closely at uh, the striae count in 10 on these guys, as well as the shape and size range. In Planethidium, we have lanceolate valves. Again, they're also, these guys are bent in girdle view. And you'll see, again, a cavum or expanded central area. In Cochineus, you'll have elliptical valves that may be flat, such as this uh, placentula, or uh, about saddle-shaped uh, in pediculus. It, for symmetric biraphids, again, we have bilateral symmetry and they're lanceolate, so like long, um, centrally located rafe on both valves. And again, here you want to look at the size range, the shape, the striae, and any unique characteristics um, to, to determine the genus. So, for example, this is a little small, but there's one row of areole bordering the axle area in Anomineus. Or you may see these, what are called needle eyes um, in the meridian rib in Amphipleura. And this is the most diverse group. So if you're looking at a diatom, there's a pretty good chance you've got a symmetric biraphid. Okay, so these are examples of navicula sensu stricto, which means they're true uh, navicula. There's a lot of genera that have been split out of navicula. Um, so when you're looking at navicula and other uh, symmetrical biraphids, you're going to look at, um, again, the overall shape, the stri in 10, um, <clears throat> the size range. And so to tell these apart, um, what I like to look for here is, again, the central area. Is there um, a space where there's not, where the striae stops? Or does it uh, go all the way to the middle? Is the striae radiate? So here you can see them kind of curving towards the middle, or are they more straight? And then are they curve strongly towards the ends or weakly towards the ends. And I also here look at the slight deflection of the proximal raphe here. So these in this one, this one and this one, you can see they're bent kind of to the left in these images. And another thing you can look at again is the, the apices here. These are um, protracted as opposed to this one is kind of rounded and this one is 
much less protracted by comparison. Other symmetric biraphids include uh, that are that are highly reported are Cellophora. Uh, Cellophora has these polar bars. You may or may not see these. And the way I remember Cellophora is they typically have finer striae, or in other words, have a higher density compared to navicula. It's not always the case, but sometimes if you can't find one in navicula and they have a high stri striae density, I would check Cellophora. Um, on the other end, there's pinularia. They have chambered striae. So what you see here are in ch individual chambers and their striae is in lots of striae inside. And so on these guys, the proximal ray fins are bent slightly in the middle. And you, when you count these, you'll count the chambers. And so compared to navicula, not always, but often when I find them, um, you would you would expect a lower count of chambered tri intent. For the asymmetric biraphids, you'll have again asymmetry to one axis typically and a centrally located raph on both valves. You'll have symbeloids and gonfanemoids sometimes uh, used as a term to describe um, where gonfanemoids have this heteropolar apices and the symboloids are again um, symmetrical to the apical axis here. And on some of these genera, you may find stigmata, which are small, um, they, look, uh, they look like dots, small dots that can be on some of these uh, genera uh, close to the rafe, rafe, excuse me. Gonfanema is one of the more commonly uh, identified genera, and uh, especially Gonfanema parvillum, you may have heard. Um, there's a lot of different species that may be called that. This one is Ligenula, um, but Gonfanema is a quite a diverse group. Some of them very hard to uh, differentiate uh, species level. So on these, again, you'll want to um, in order to get to species, look very closely at the stride count, um, the size range. Uh, generally, these are club shaped and the stigma may be present here and you can see them. And these guys also have an apical pore field where they may uh, make some stalks. In Encyanema, they're also again asymmetric to the apical axis and the stigma is located dorsally on these guys um, and the distal ray fins are deflected ventrally so you can see it's in this orientations picture they're coming down versus symbella where a little bit the opposite the stigma is located ventrally and the deflect the distal ray fins are deflected dorsally so you see a hook up in this orientation of this picture. And then amphora has the raphe along the ventral margin. So it's gonna be not gonna be directly in the center, but you'll still see it here. Um, the complete valve is wedge shaped. So instead of focusing through, you may see a complete valve. Uh, you'll be able to see both valves at the same time, valve faces. Um, and you may find an interrupted striae uh, along the valve face. In the eunoshids, they're usually asymmetrical to the apical axis. And, and as we saw before, actinella is completely asymmetrical. Um, and they have the raphe again on the valve mantle and face uh, usually. Uh, in this case, not, but we had um, a speaker previously, it was Paula Fury and uh, Mark, if you both there, we have um, her presentation on Unosha, uh, much more knowledgeable than me about Unosha. Um, but what, I, um, and Unosha is most likely, the most likely genera um, you would have if you find the Unosha. 
Um, you can see here again that they have uninterrupted striate. And I like to think of these guys as kind of um, the mustache shaped group. If you have a diatom that's like, you know, that, that would make a good mustache. Like you may have a Enosha. Epithemioids, asymmetrical to the apical axis. The raphe is in a canal again. The may or may not be obvious. And they have the large transapical costate. And as of May 2020, the genus Ropologia was subsumed into epithemia on the diatoms. <laughs> Website, thank you for your comment, Paula. You know she must is on a stick at the next meeting. Um, so uh, I think your chances of getting epithemia are pretty good if you've got an epithemioid. Um, again, you'd want to look here at the canal. Um, you can use the depth of the canal here to try to speciate these guys. You can also use their size range and the number of striae between the costae would be another clue. Um, this one used to be Ropologia. Um, and now uh, these guys also have um, uh, a wedge shaped structure. So just like Amphora, you would see both valves um, in a on a complete diatom. The nitschioids, usually symmetrical to both axes, raphe supported by fibulae, and the fibulae are typically on one side of the valve. Um, to try to get to the genus here, you would want to note uh, if you've got any special structures here. So on Grenoia, you've got large, large fibulae. Um, some of these are asymmetric to one axis. And in Cylindrotheca, you have a twisted raphe that goes all the way around the, uh, around the frustral. Nitschia is one of the more commonly encountered genera where the raphe is on the opposite end of each valve usually. In this case, um, it's a bit down the valve face, but you can see the short fibulae here. And you'll want to rely again on the size range and either the striae or the fibulae density, depending on what you, you can see. In Triblinella, the raphe is again on the opposite side of each frustral. And these guys have a longitudinal fold uh, down the center as well. And then Bacillaria, which is the namesake of the class. Um, this guy again has fibulae uh, down the center. And um, this was the first genus that was named for the diatoms. Sirorelloids have the bilateral symmetry and the raphe supported by fibulae all around the valve margin. Now, Sorella, they're sym symmetric to one or both axes. Again, rely on shape, size, range, and fibrillate density to try to get to the species on these. Um, one of the other more commonly reported genera was Sematoplura. And again, as of May 2020, these have been subsumed into Sorella. So at this point, I figured we could have some audience participation and try to identify some unknowns. Let's see if I can. Can you guys see? The diatom on the right, you can put in the comments. We can see it, Melissa. Yes, thank you. Okay, so here's the diatom and this is my live microscope. So you can see I'm focusing through. Can anybody in the comments tell me which group, which morphological group this would belong to and why?
if you're having trouble, I'm focusing through. There's a, a raphe down the center of the valve. And on the other side of the valve is a mirror image. It's the same shape and um, another valve or another raphe. Okay, so you would pick symmetrical, asymmetrical by, or excuse me, symmetrical by raphid. Thank you. And so if you're in the know, like Leela, um, you would see this oops, staros here, which is a, a, the clearing in the uh, central area. And so you would look for that on the diatoms webpage. Ooh. Here. And then you could choose the species um, either here or looking in other um, in other references. Is this interesting or do you guys want to try another one? Let's try another one. Okay. Let's try this one here in the center. I'm going to focus up and down. <laughs> Can anybody tell me which morphological group this one belongs to and why? If you need some help, <laughs> you've got one Rafi valve here, and the other valve lacks that. <laughs> mm. Okay, yes, mono raphid. So choose mono raphid here. Thank you. Yes, we have a cavum. And so that would take us to our choices are something like Planethidium, Glitzia, Scabachuskia. I'm sorry if I'm not quite pronouncing these. Um, looking at the striae, my first uh, guess would be to try Planethidium. And so you can look again here or go to other references um, if they're not here. Do you want to do one more or shall I move on? Just noting the time. One more, okay. <laughs> Well, let's, let's try a hard one. I'm gonna try very slowly to focus. Mm 
Uh, for me, I would, I'm looking right here to see if there's any ray fee, and I don't see one, if that's helpful. <laughs> Fake you, Nosha, yes. <laughs> So which group, which group should I pick? No Rafi, a Rafid, this one. Fragilaria forma, yes. <sighs> Let's see. Here, symmetrical. Wow. Try all the way across the Rafe or across the bow face. If you were to imagine it in your mind's eye. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys for participating. Um, and so again, from here, this was just to get to the genus level, um, to get to the species. Um, if you have trouble using um, diatoms.org, um, you may have to go to other references. These are some of the more commonly used once KNLB or the green book and um, the uh, silver one diatoms of Europe. And you may have to look in other scattered literature um, to find what you have, or you may have something completely new. Um, so you'll want to scrutinize the diatoms you have uh, very carefully. And that is all for me. Special thanks again to the Diatom Taxonomic Certification Committee for allowing me the opportunity to speak. And thank you to Envira Science, especially Brad, for helping me out a little bit with this presentation. And thank you guys for, for participating and, and coming to watch our presentations. All right. Thank, thank you, Melissa, for that for your presentation. That was that was great, and I love the audience participation factor. <laughs> that I, 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 if so, if people have questions they'd like to ask Melissa, please type them into the chat, and we'll uh, we'll pose them to her. One thing I want to put in there is this: is that um, Melissa's talked a lot about sort of the genera of diatoms, and we do have a uh, diatom level one genus exam that the diatom taxonomic certification committee has already uh, put put on and it's um, hosted by and administered by the uh, uh, at, at Stroud, uh, the Stroud Environmental Center. Um, you can find it at that link that I just I just put in there. So one question I want to just start with um, Melissa is what it, it, you, I mean, you, you said we, we learned you came from the cyanobacterial world and went into diatoms. What do you think the sort of the best way to learn diatoms is? Um, as someone, um, if someone wants to either, you know, is hired to learn diatoms or you know, just wants to learn diatoms, what's the best way to do that? Um, I think the best way is to just look at, at slides um and practice focusing up and down and and looking at them and imagining you know these are 3d and so you you want to be able to imagine them in your mind's eye because you you can't pick them up and look at them uh at at the level of um detail you you'd need to identify them um so yes i think i think the best way to be to to look at slides okay all right thanks um kyle's asked us do when you're counting stri in a diatom, you introduced in um, some of the a aphids the, the concept of ghost stri. Uh, when you're when you're counting stri density, would you would you also count those ghost stri? No, I would not. I would pick a uh, more let's see more centralized location uh, or not central centralized between the central area and the <laughs> and the apes um, where the striae are pretty regular. And so I would count the striae in 10 in a, in a place like that. Hmm. Um, any, any, Kyle, Kyle also brought up um, other, other genera, including things like uh, um, diatoms where the, the striae split. Is there, is there a standardized place where um, people, we should, we should be measuring striae density in a, in a diatom? 
Um, I haven't had occasion myself to uh, to count strive frequently on Caravia. I don't run into them nearly so frequently mm -hmm. um, because there's other uh, things about their morphology that I would note. Um, so let's take a look. Look at them. I think it. I think it's situations like in like in Carrieva, Carrieva clevii where as the stri goes from the. the center axis of the diatom towards the edge, they often split and bifurcate. So I think that's what that was, that was what Kyle is uh, is um, is doing. Sylvia has also provided a, a a nice link that we have on the on the diatoms.org website on how to measure stri and where you might want to place that sort of 10 micron um, that 10 micron uh, line that we're gonna that we count stri on. Right. Yeah. I I would put it right about here mm -hmm. yeah yeah it used to be that people would when they when they published big floors they'd often even say like here's where i measured my stride and you know draw it put an image of, of how they did it and we also um shared a link shared a link there of how uh, on centric diatoms since they're round the challenges that you have in measuring stride density on a on a thing um uh Alayla from uh, Paris has asked, when, when you're working in, in amphoroid genera, the, the, the amphora group, um, what do you use to decide if you have an amphora or a, a halamphora? So I'm usually, for me, I usually look to see if there's that central uh, area on the valve where there's a stri interruption, although I don't know if that is a uh, I don't remember if that's a defining feature uh, between amphora and, and halamphora. Um, if you can see my screen, you can fly over here. Um, let's see. Yeah, the dorsal fascia usually absent. That's what I go for. Okay, thanks. Um, Tom has asked us um, how to deal with um, varieties of diatoms as, you, as, you're, as you're doing your taxonomy and, and data analysis. He says, if I have Nitsia paleo and also Nitsia variety, paleo variety debilis and paleo variety tenuorostris in a single sample, should I count these varieties as part of my richness count or just pool them as a single species group? So um, for analysis, when we, when we do these counts, um, we will have a, a secondary count. And so in a quality control, um, if the two taxonomists looking at this can, can um, determine um, these uh, var species variants, um, then, then perhaps you'd want to keep them. Um, but I, we don't usually find a lot of um, overlap sometimes uh, for these guys. And in the large, in, in, in assessments where there's a large number of samples and a large number of taxonomists, um, we've, I think we feel better uh, lumping these. Um, although, and now again, in a harmonization, um, if we spend the time really looking at them and making sure that everybody understands um, what and it has the same definition of what what makes one one variety and one makes one another a uh, variety um, then you would be able to to do that okay so keep them keep them keep them separated as long as you can and use the harmonization exercise of your of your various analysts to sort of make that or decide whether you're going to group them or not 
Um, while we wait for another question, I wanted to ask you a little bit. One of the things I, I noticed, um, not only did you use your microscope in your presentation, a first for us, thank you, but um, I'm kind of curious, what's your, um, if you could give us just a little bit of thoughts about um, uh, my, the microscopes you, you're using, um, not, not your specifically, but as, you know, as people who want to identify diatoms, what, you know, what should they be wanting to have um, available for themselves to do this? Is it, you know, you know what kind of, how good should their scope be? Should they have that nice camera sitting on top? Um, what kind of things are really important in terms of um, um, how we identify diatoms? Right. So, um... In, in our case, we got a microscope that was specific um, to follow the EPA uh, NURSA standard microscope. And so these have a high, um, high quality. Uh, so you can see the, uh, see the stri separations. Um, well, I can't remember the, the name of it, but there was a, there was a specification where um, your, your, your microscope does have to be a certain quality in order to be able to see some of these, um, some of these uh, striae. Uh, yeah, and the, yeah, and the, so the, yeah, the, I think it's the, uh, the, level of, the numerical app, numerical aperture of the lens. Yeah. Yes. And, and remind me, do you, you normally um, do all of your analysis with oil immersion or is it? Yes, we use. 1000x oil immersion. Okay, okay. And is the is having a camera on top um, uh, really important for analysis? Um, in our case, we are taking pictures for the client, so yes. Um, but what's nice about it is like, uh, like you saw me kind of demonstrate is you can take a picture and you can put it up right next to um, the diatoms.org image for comparison. And so if you take, and you can also take a bunch of pictures across the slide and line them all up for comparison. And so for, for speciating uh, the, the diatoms that you have, the camera can be available. Yeah, I, I, re I, really, I really liked how you, you showed us how we could do that, actually have the, the overlying screens like that. I have, I have actually never done that. that was, I thought that was great to just have them both sitting there open and uh, what a what a super way to to do that do that that comparison that we have here. Well, um, we're coming up towards the top of the hour. If anyone has any final questions, please go ahead and uh, and and tap them in. We did have one question early on, a little bit about um, uh, uh, molecular analyses and eDNA as a as a as a monitoring tool, and we posted uh, a couple of previous. Um, uh, Diatom Web Academy talks that we had that that uh, treated that treated that aspect. Um, have have you has your lab used molecular approaches yet for um, uh, diatom analysis, Melissa? We have not. No, nope. sticking with your microscope. <laughs> okay, well, very good. Well, I want to I want to thank everyone for um, for for joining us today, and especially I want to thank thank Melissa for for joining us. Um, I, I wanted to tell you next that uh, our next, um, our next uh, in two weeks, we're going to have our, our next uh, Diatom Web Academy. Um, remember what Sylvia said at the beginning, um, it's gonna be Aga Panowska uh, joining us from Hawaii. And we've had to tweak the time just a little, just a little bit to, um, to make, make, uh, make, make her available for that, that, that presentation. But please join us and we'll have the updated time uh, posted on the diatoms.org news uh, website. So I really appreciate everyone joining us today. And, and thanks for, uh, again, Melissa, for, for giving us a Diatoms 101. Thanks for having me.